Guys, we are the light that's supposed to reflect God's goodness. If I said you this is for believers, and if we're a believer in this room tonight, is your light displaying that of God, the goodness of God? It is not possible for light and dark to be in the same room. And when the Bible speaks here of darkness, it's representing sin. But let me explain two things that light does. The first thing the light does is exposes your sin in your life. Light can't come into your life and not expose things to you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, how many of you have been there? I know I have many times in my life where all of a sudden something is exposed to me that I'm doing wrong. It's that light. It's Jesus' light that reveals that to us. The first thing the light's going to do is represent and, and display the sin in our life. The second thing the light does is it reveals our character and our conduct, conduct to the world around us. It reveals our character and our conduct to the world around us. You see, people are looking for the light. People want the truth. And most of us as Christians have it and aren't displaying it. The Bible teaches us that Satan has blinded the eyes of the lost. But here's what I want to tell you. There's not a blindfold out there that Satan can own that the light of Jesus Christ cannot penetrate. It's that powerful. And if it's that powerful, why do we not tap into that same resource, that same light in our lives, and let that light be what shines to the mankind around us? The first Easter morning brought a new day. Christians are no longer sleeping in sin and death, and we've been raised from dead through faith in Him. Salvation is the beginning of a new day, and we ought to walk in this light of salvation and do all we can to bring this light to those who have not seen it. Point number two, shine your light. Paul goes on with one more point in this section of, of Ephesians, and he says, you must become wise. He talks to us about becoming wise. Verses 15 through 21 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Because why? He says it. The days are evil. How many of you know we live in evil days? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You see, many of us as Americans, I've seen this in American culture, most of you have too, we wake up every morning and we just kind of drift through the day. We just kind of want to get through the day, don't we? But here's what happens in a lifestyle of drifting. If we get to the point where we wake up and we want to drift through the day, then here's what happens. We drift through life. And we miss it. And we miss it. I heard a preacher say this one time. It's probably one of the most profound statements. I have it written in my Bible. There was a few things I've written in my Bible, sermons I've heard, preachers I've heard say things. And he said one thing out of his whole sermon that I wrote down. This is what he said, and I hope it empowers you and impacts you the way it did me. He said, we have all of eternity to celebrate our victories but only one life to win them. Great preacher. Great man of God. And when he said that, it inspired me. It drew me to this reality that I am not wise. I wasn't necessarily walking in the light. I wasn't necessarily loving the Lord the way I should love the Lord. And when he said that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like hopefully it just hits you. Church, we must wake up and become wise. Wisdom comes from three main areas. I'm going to give you those. Three main areas that wisdom comes from. Number one, and I put this one first, and I hope you will too, our own intentional study of God's Word. Number two, our own quiet prayer time with God, seeking His direction in our life. And thirdly, what you're here by assembling together with other believers through the church services and small groups where we can grow together and hold each other accountable in the Lord. 
Those are the three ways we become wise. Wisdom of God and the things of God is what directs our lives and helps us have the greatest impact on the lost world around us. We, get this, we are the plan that Christ is using to tell others about Him. There is no plan B. We're it. We're it. We're it, church. We're it. And we tend to make God's plan very difficult and God's plan very hard. But here's what I want to tell you. God's plan was simple. As we wrap up tonight here, pay attention to this. Accept Christ and live for Him. You see, in America today, we seem to have no problem with the accepting Christ part, do we? The trouble comes when we think about living for Him. You see, faith is only one part of the equation. I want you to think of a math equation. Four times something equals something. Can you solve the problem? No, I can't either. We have to have at least two parts of that equation in order to be able to solve the problem. So like a math equation, not only must we have faith, but we must have actions. You see, our faith isn't enough. We must have actions. Our actions must speak. Our actions must tell. Our actions must show that God is real and that He exists in our life. Paul said earlier in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, if you want to look back there. He said, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus I capitalize these next two words. To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And as I was studying, God just kept revealing a scripture verse to me, and I couldn't think of it off the top of my head, and I felt stupid. I felt like, God, I should know this verse. What are you telling me? And then it kind of came to me. James chapter 2, in verses 14 through 17, we see James made it very, very clear what we're to do. This is what he says. What good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has not deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Verse 26, he closes out that chapter with this. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Churches in America have done a great job of teaching about salvation and faith. But it's been on my heart for a while that for some reason there seems to be this big, huge disconnect on the other side of that equation, and that is what we do. I mean, I see people that claim to be Christians, and then I look how they live their life, and I say, Really? Now, I'm not to judge their salvation, and I choose not to, but I'm just telling you, there's people that you see, and you say, oh, they come to church, and they will pray at the dinner table, but then they'll get into an argument with you about how can God really exist. It happened to me not too long ago. I told the guy finally, I said, listen, if this is where you want to be, fine. I'm telling you the truth, but don't pray at the dinner table for me. I'll do it myself. I still love the guy. I'm still going to pray for the guy. But I'm just telling you, how can in one breath you say God exists and God is real, and in the other breath say, I'm not so sure. Faith without action is dead. Now here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to blame the churches or the pastors in America today for this problem alone. I do believe there are some churches and some pastors out there who are leading their people into thinking that salvation is enough and that all they need is salvation. I'm just here to tell you that probably the reality is is most of us don't get the other side of that equation. It took me a long time to get that other part of that equation. I wrote this. The problem may just lie on us not wanting to give up our selfish life and our own desires in pursuing the things of God. And in my opinion, I believe this is what's happened. Our lives are full of excuses on why we cannot do certain things the Lord is calling us to. This was true for me. About 10 years ago, God called me to go to seminary. 
For eight years, I said no. And they're probably the worst eight years of my life. And then God said, go, reminded me, go. And I went. Now let me tell you something. When I went, I was serving part-time as a junior high director at another church in the area. And God moved me out of that position within six months of going to get my seminary degree. It would have been real easy, wouldn't it, to just walk away from it all. But I knew God had a bigger plan. I knew God had a bigger focus. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to let this stop me. We started the Tendon Journey Church. The pastors here were great to my wife and my family and I. Very encouraging and finishing. Very encouraging in all that they did for us. I completed that degree in May of this year. Which really, I, I, it's God to be honest with you. Because I completed it in May. Finished with a 3.5 grade point average in the master's. I got out of college with my bachelor's at a 2.2. But that just tells you it wasn't me. Okay, it wasn't me. It was God doing it all. But look, my point is, it took me eight years to answer the call that God had placed in my life. And it wasn't until I finished that I saw the rewards. I struggled through those eight years. And towards the end, about the last two semesters I had, I actually told myself, I'm finishing and I'm finishing now because I'm getting frustrated. And I took four classes as a full-time father who was a very active family and a business owner. I took four classes every semester online. My kids never saw me. My wife never saw me. If we were home, I was in a room somewhere, reading, writing. But it took me, I don't want glory for myself. I just want to tell you that God's called us to stuff. And I tell you that story just to tell you that maybe he's calling you and you're fighting it too. Not school. Whatever it may be. Carlos is going to come. And as I wrap up, um, there's one area of the church that I'd like you to awaken to. 